If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. This is my type of episode right here, if you know what I'm saying. If you know what I'm saying. Yes. Yeah, we uh, we got the uh, senior subject matter expert and content producer and host of the Leafly podcast, What Are You Smoking? So Leafly is one of the largest websites online. Uh, it talks about cannabis. It's a cannabis website. It rates cannabis, tells you the effects, you know, what, all about the different uh, types of cannabinoids. Um, and he represents them. He came on our show and we talked – all about cannabis, the science of cannabis, mm. the history of cannabis. It was a good talk. It was a good. He, he's a dab enthusiast. He likes the dabbing. He does. Yeah, that's a little yeah. strong for me, though. Yeah, it's a little much for me. Yeah, though. I like. I'm I'm old school. Yeah, yeah, I'm cool with that. Yeah, if you're it was not a fun into, discussion though, it was. If you're not into marijuana, this is probably not an episode for you. But if you're interested in cannabis, I thought it was a very interesting episode. Definitely, absolutely. So again, his name is William Hyde. Great guy. You can find him on Instagram at the dot avid dot dabber. Uh, again, he hosts the podcast on Leafly called What Are You Smoking? And then Leafly is just leafly.com. Um, and before we get into the interview, this is the final day for our promotion, uh, our end of the year promotion. It's the final day to get one year of free access to our private forum for enrolling in any of our MAPS fitness programs. Again, if you enroll in any MAPS fitness program today when this episode drops, you'll get a free full year of access to our private forum. Just go to mapsfitnessproducts.com, check out all of our programs Find the one that works best for you. And that's it. So here we are talking to uh, William. William, I want you to, just because a lot of our audience might not know who you are and what you do, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself real quick. and Yeah, so I am Will Hyde. Um, I go by the Avid Dabber on Instagram, so some people may know me that way. The Avid Dabber? Um, the Avid Dabber. Oh, interesting. Yep. Okay. Um, <laughs> I am a content producer and subject matter expert for Leafly, a okay. cannabis information resource aimed at uh, really helping consumers find cannabis, whatever that means to them, whether it's find information and find ways that they can connect with cannabis or cannabis can connect with them or literally find cannabis, like find a dispensary, find the right strain for you, find a product that you're looking for. Now, you guys are like the largest website online that does that with cannabis. You guys are the biggest ones, right? Correct. Yep. Are, are you guys publicly or privately funded? Privately funded currently. Yep. Okay. And yeah, it was like 15 million visits a month or something like that on your website? Yeah, something like that. Wow. It's it's literally, it grows so fast that it's a tough number to keep track of because if I say something, um, all my analysts are going to tell me, you know, we, we broke 16 million last month yeah, or whatever. Yeah. So, but yeah, uh, you know, around 15 million and climbing every single month. Yeah. So your website I used, I've used quite a bit because it Excellent. has uh, user reviews on there. So they talk about like how strains affect them. Right. It also has, my favorite part is the science that you can get in, 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 in on, oh, yeah. on that website. And then the uh, articles and news that you guys are publishing, mm -hmm. uh, which I find uh, very interesting. But I wanted to talk a little bit about cannabis and how it affects people and the, the different cannabinoids and why some people react so differently to some strains versus others. If we can kind of break it down, you know, maybe start at the top with cannabinoids. and Yeah, definitely. So there's sort of two, two main components in cannabis that give you the effects as well as the flavor and create essentially the whole cannabis experience. Um, so one is cannabinoids and the other is terpenes. Um, cannabinoids are chemical compounds, natural and native to the cannabis plant. They produce them um, in the trichome, which are the little crystals you see on the buds. Um, and in there, uh, the glands secrete oils, some containing cannabinoids, some containing terpenes. And the cannabinoids are things you might have heard of like THC, CBD, but there's a whole bunch of secondary and tertiary cannabinoids that we're really just starting to dive into, um, both their medical benefits, their therapeutic benefits, and of course, um, their, their overall effects. But each of those cannabinoids um, it stimulates our endocannabinoid system, which is a system of receptors in our brain and our body that essentially receives cannabinoids and allows us to digest them and, and um, utilize them. Um, now, there's 
there's sort of ongoing discussion, debate, and um, investigation into exactly what the endocannabinoid does as a system within our body. But um, in my personal experience and the way I like to describe it to people, it's really a balancing mechanism. Um, and it helps balance out the rest of the systems in your body, which is why it can really um, – it can do things like stimulate an appetite for chemotherapy patients that don't otherwise, um, you know, have the ability to eat or, or the hunger to eat when they're on heavy doses of chemotherapy and things like that. Um, now, where terpenes come into play is they actually modulate the effects or, or they increase our ability uh, to accept the cannabinoids within our receptors. So um, they're working in tandem in something that a lot of people like to call the entourage effect. So you can think about it as, um, you know, a few different flavors and a few different um, effects-based sort of feeling compounds all working in unison to provide the cannabis experience. Now, each strain will ex uh, express you know, different levels and different concentrations of all of these compounds. And that's why effects and flavors and smells of each cannabis strain vary from strain to strain. Now, here's this is an interesting factoid that I've I brought up on the show before. Scientists didn't even know we had a endocannabinoid system until we were studying the why people get high off of uh, off of marijuana or cannabis. And then they discovered, oh, we have these receptors that, right. that's, that, that they seem to attach to. And then that led them down the path of the cannabinoids or the endocannabinoids that we produce ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, and so now we've learned about them, but it's through the study of, of cannabis. If we can break it down even uh, just even more for the layman, because I think sometimes when we talk about a subject like this, we're all uh, enthusiasts. I love studying the <laughs> science of, uh, of, of cannabis myself. Sometimes I forget that a lot of people just don't know some of the basics. Oh, like, totally. <laughs> sati like sativas and indicas. Now, uh, they look different. They grow in different temperatures. But historically, or I guess the, uh, the belief is anecdotally that sativas produce more of this energetic kind of- Psychoactive. Yeah, high, you know, whereas indicas are more of this stony body type of high- right. Is there truth to that? And if so, why? Like, what's what's going on there? Uh, simply put, no, there isn't truth to that. Um, the reality is, is that indica sativa classifications of cannabis is just sort of an oversimplification that's been used through the illicit market, the medical market, to to start to explain some of the ways that cannabis can make you feel. Okay. Um, now, the reality is the, the only indicator that indica or sativa will actually tell you is the things you've already mentioned. It's the, the look, the shape, the size, the actual morphology of the plant and how it's going to look and act when you grow it. So it's still an important um, piece of data to know, especially if you're growing cannabis. Um, sativas tend to take a longer flowering cycle, 10, even 12 or 14 weeks, whereas indicas are much shorter, sometimes as short as six, but usually around eight weeks. Um, and a lot of modern hybrids, which is mostly what you'll see on the market now, um, are things that have taken from both sides of that and mixed a little of that and a mixed a little of this to create the new modern hybrids we see like cookies, like um, Skittles, like <laughs> all of those flavors you might see Real at the dispensary. Ones, yeah. yeah. <laughs> High, highly medical strain. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, why, now, so it's a myth. It's a myth that the sativas, you know, make you more energetic and paranoid and the indicas give you couch lock. That's just an oversimplification. It's an oversimplification. And it's not that it's not that you can't get those effects from cannabis, but to make the blanket statement to say that all sativas are going to make you feel this way mm -hmm. is just not correct. Um, really what matters is the actual chemical makeup within that individual strain. So um, we, we call that the chemotype. Um, there's also um, there's also the phenotype, which describes more of the morphology and the different ways that the genetics will actually express itself. Interesting. That's fascinating. So the one, the two cannabinoids that people are most familiar with are THC, right? That's the one yep. that gets you high and makes it psychoactive. And then CBD now, which is getting all this uh, publicity because it's being studied for its non-psychoactive but therapeutic effects, in particular for uh, something like epilepsy or neurological type disorders. But there's a whole lot of cannabinoids yeah. that are found in the cannabis plant. Are there other cannabinoids that we're starting to see some interesting things mm. with? I, I think there's one called, is it CBC or cannabichromium? I think it, 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 they showed that it 
It helped promote uh, brain cell, you know, regrowth or growth or whatnot. Am I off base here? No, no, no. There's there's literally um, more cannabinoids than I could even list. Um, but so many of them are found in such small concentrations that we're really just starting to dive into exactly what each one can do. But yeah, there's CBG. There's um, CBN, uh, which is actually what THC converts to over time. Um, so if you've ever had really, really old cannabis um, that's maybe cured for a really long time or uh, been left out so that it degraded a little bit, it gets really stony and really sleepy. Oh. That's the CBN. That's the effects of oh, CBN. And so um, I know a few companies specifically are working with CBN um, as like a sleep remedy for insomnia and some of those things oh, because sense. we have we have enough anecdotal evidence to say that when THC is converted into CBN, we can attribute those sleepy, stony effects to the CBN. Um, and it's relatively easy compared to some of the other cannabinoids anyway, to convert THC into CBN. It's just time, heat, and sometimes a little bit of light. But um, as they're extracting it and doing things like that, they have the power to manipulate some of those things. That's really interesting. What what is do you guys are you guys playing a role in the legalization movement which is exploding now? Are you guys playing any role in that? Yeah, of course we are. I think um, the biggest role that Leafly plays specifically is just um, getting the news out about what ballot measures people can vote on, um, what politicians support this, um, how you can get involved and support it yourself. Um, uh, you know, we we lift a lot of other great organizations that are doing a lot of great work on the legalization front. Um, and we are really designed to support all all types of cannabis businesses, whether you're a lobbying group that's supporting, you know, advocacy or whether you're a dispensary who wants to retail cannabis or a grower who wants to grow it or, or an extractor, anything you can think of, we're developing tools uh, to help those businesses uh, perform both in the digital space and to actually make their business ongoing and functional. Well, mm -hmm. how did you get into this? Mm -hmm. So I got, I mean, I've always been attracted to cannabis. I, the first time it was introduced to me, I was never one of those people that was like, oh, what a, you know, I don't know if I should go down that path. I, it always sparked a curiosity with me. Um, and so, you know, as, as more of an adolescent, it was obviously just sort of a fun thing um, that I would do. And I enjoyed more than drinking and some of other activities. So, um, you know, I was just always drawn to cannabis. I worked, um, you know, in the illicit space for quite some time. Um, and then when I moved to Los Angeles for film school, I was basically introduced to medical cannabis. Uh, at the time, California was the only state that really had a medical cannabis program. And when I got to film school and started talking to my classmates about how to find cannabis, they're like, oh, you can get a medical card. You can go to a dispensary. And I was just sort of blown away at the accessibility of it once you once you did just a little bit of research and found out how you could do it. Um, so from there, I really just wanted to learn more and more about the medical benefits, um, but also just the genetic diversity has always been really, really interesting to me. There's very few plants that humans engage with like cannabis and very few that have the genetic diversity that cannabis has. Um, and part of that is due to the clandestine nature of the industry itself and a lot of the breeding and, and information remaining underground for so long. Um, but from there, you know, my, I ended up just spending day after day after day at different dispensaries until one opened up down the block from me and then they couldn't get rid of me. And then eventually they said, Hey, we're short staffed. Can you, bud tend for us. And I said, sure. And so me and a few friends ended up bud tending and that spiraled into buying for the dispensary, managing it when the owner went away, um, really like building the business around sort of the local community we had there in the, the greater Hollywood area. And then um, after that, I just, I started helping patients set up medical grows. I started working with other um, growers cooperatively to grow for other patients. Um, and, and, you know, so I just sort of was, was self-taught, super curious, um, looked for any way that I could both help lift the plant and lift the people that needed the plant. 
Um, and then from there, uh, when the recession hit, I decided I needed to go back to school for business, which I did uh, back home in Seattle, went to UW. And then after that uh, was right when I was getting out of business school was right when Washington was looking to legalize. And I knew that I wanted to get in the cannabis space in some sense now that it was being legitimized. Um, and from there, I, I pretty much just fell right into Leafly, which was the perfect mix of, you know, digital marketing, uh, content creation, video production, um, and my passion and knowledge behind cannabis. So. so you were there early, early on. This is when only L.A. was probably doing LA, L.A. and maybe Oakland, right? Harborside was was that were you that far back? Or? Yeah. So when I first started in the dispensary space, this was 2005. So okay. it's really what I would consider like the wild, wild west where dispensaries were popping up basically every week. Another one was shutting down every other week. So you were kind of like chasing these dots of dispensaries around the map of Los Angeles to find different deals, to find different strains and to find the community um, because the community wasn't going anywhere, even though these dispensaries and the feds were you know, uh, doing their thing. So you got to, you got to share with the audience. I, I was, uh, involved in the beginning of San Jose. So I was a part of the first two clubs to ever start here in the Bay area. And, uh, exactly how I describe it is the wild, wild west. So you got to tell our audience, uh, what the evolution has been like for someone like you, who's been in as early as you have. Totally. So, uh, I mean, when I was cruising around, I mean, one thing we did in my early days as a medical patient was you always sought out new patient deals because, um, every dispensary would run a new patient deal, a free gram, a free joint, a free edible, uh, $10 off your eighth, whatever it was, um, just by signing up and getting into their system because that's how they function. The bigger their patient base is, the the more weed they could legally carry, the more patients they were legally supplying. Mm. So to build up both their inventory and their customer base, they'd sign patients on, um, which is what we would do. We would shop around at different dispensaries and capitalize on all those those deals. And in those days, you saw literally everything as far as dispensaries. You saw people who were investing and really creating a retail experience, but you also walked into, you know, some back alley doors where it was a guy with three jars of weed and a baseball bat, you know? Um, <laughs> so there's literally been the whole gambit of of everything as close to like black market sales, as you could imagine, to um, high-end retail experiences, although those high-end retail experiences haven't really been successful until recently when uh, cannabis has become actually legalized at a state level and people are, you know, a little more secure about spending the the overhead needed to really create that experience and to create a safe environment, knowing that they're not going to get shut down next week and some of that stuff. So nowadays you walk in and, and again, you see a lot of different styles of retailing cannabis, but everything from like the Apple store where you're scanning menus on your iPad and, um, you know, the geek squads coming up to you with their earpiece and, and phoning in your order for you to, um, you know, people really taking, um, patient care to the next level and providing a consultation. Um, I know some places that literally they, they won't really let you in their system without like a 30 minute consultation with one of their bud tenders or a doctor that they keep on staff. And it's really just to educate the patient or the consumer, but also to understand how they can better serve you. Um, and so those are a little more like concierge services, I guess. But um, you see everything now. I mean, I was at the Emerald Cup this weekend where uh, farmers and dispensaries and and brands were um, selling cannabis right on site. And there was, you know, vending machines. There was, um, you know, iPad programs and pickup and different ways that people were were, you know, using sort of omni channel retail um, to to close the deal or to secure the transaction between uh, dispensary and consumer. Wow, that's wild. Now you you now you now host the podcast also? Yeah, I host a podcast called uh, What Are You Smoking? It's a strains and products focused podcast where we bring on guests, but we discuss basically all the, all the new genetics that are exciting or that we've come across, mm. as well as the products and brands that we really love or that we've been engaging with or, or that have just, um, you know, we've seen help someone or really anything. Yeah. Yeah, let's let's go into that for a little bit. I know when it was all black market, the main 
things that growers would try to breed for was just maximum THC. Like that was the most, which strain could get you the highest because people buying on the black market weren't buying it for really for medicinal purposes. It was just, I want to get stoned. And now that it's been legalized, uh, it, it, it seems like you're, first of all, you have, you have CBD strains now, which you couldn't find before. Mm-hmm. What are, what other things are you starting to see now with the, with the, with the breeding? Yeah. Breeding is, is really interesting. I mean, one, the biggest thing people have been breeding for recently is terpenes. Um, you know, the smell and aroma of cannabis has always been important, um, when you're purchasing or, or when you're selecting between different strains. Um, but because everything was kept underground, having really loud and, and odiferous cannabis was actually sort of bad in a lot of senses because that was an easy way. And (laughs) the number one way for authorities to know that you have cannabis as if it was really loud. So people would, would, whether they knew it or not, were sort of selectively breeding out some of those skunkier, more, um, pungent cannabis strains. So recently, um, in the past five, 10 years, we've seen a resurgence, uh, because you don't have to think we don't have to keep things. So sort of under lock and key, we can be a little bit more, um, out about our cannabis use and the fact that it, it is in our pocket, that it is in the trunk of our car, wherever it may be. Um, and so, you know, different terpenes, we still predominantly see that most cannabis on dispensary shelves are, um, high THC, THC dominant strains, and they are myrcene dominant, which is, um, basically the most prevalent terpene in cannabis. Um, what's, what kind of smell is that? Is that piney? Um, no. So myrcene is actually also found in mango. Um, it doesn't really have a mango smell per se. Um, but it does a lot of people attribute it to some of the more, um, sedating, relaxing, calming effects of cannabis. Okay. Mm. So, uh, so the, they're, are they doing that on purpose because of the effects or because of the smell? Because people just like the smell. I think it's both. Uh, and that's like, it, uh, like give, give me a strain that had, that's high in mercy. Cause I I'm uh, kind of almost thinking. any strain, I believe blue dream, one of the most popular strains it's out there. One is, of Adam's favorites is THC dominant, myrcene dominant. Um, and so, but, but like I said, I, I mean, we haven't crunched all the numbers, but just at getting a few snapshots, I would say, you know, easily over 60% of the market is high THC myrcene dominant. Now you, hmm. speaking of blue dream and I, I find this interesting because so did you bring any, yeah, right. <laughs> you, you made a comment that uh, I always assume that the reason why I liked blue dream so much was I really enjoyed the, the split of about 60% sativa, 40% indica. But you kind of shit on that a little bit ago. That that probably has less to do with it. What would you probably is, or what would you say is the reason why I I like that feeling that it gives me? If it's not that, I thought maybe it was this nice balance of it wasn't too heady. It didn't make me too psychoactive or paranoid. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it also uh, wasn't so what I would refer to as indica dominant that would make me feel tired and sleepy. Right. But, and it, and it is, okay. it is those things. Okay. Um, but it's not because of its indica sativa classification. Right. Right. Um, which is what I thought. That's right. What, that's what right. We've... And so, I mean, part of it is that cannabis is a tool and cannabis can be basically anything to anyone. And the more preconceived notion you put on a cannabis experience, the more likely it is you are to have that experience. Mm. If you say, oh, every time I smoke, I'm paranoid. If you smoke, especially high THC strains, you're probably going to get paranoid. That's just uh, the brain is a powerful, powerful tool. And we have the ability to manipulate our experiences with what we put in our brain, whether it's substance or thought. So Mm. um, I think... So the paranoia you think is a, is a lot to do with just high THC? High THC is known to create anxiety, okay. which is, you know, a, a symptom or a, or a, a part of, of paranoia. And so really what, what I believe the sort of paranoia angle of cannabis comes mm-hmm. from is consuming high doses of THC in an illicit market mm-hmm. where you're constantly looking over your shoulder and have been for 10 years. And so the higher you get, the more anxious you get, <clears throat> knowing that you're doing something that might be breaking the law or pushing the limits, you're mm-hmm. naturally a little more paranoid. Yeah, I found for me that the ideal amount, if I'm going to have a high THC strain, it's going to be no more than like 14, 15% THC, 
which is actually kind of getting hard to find nowadays. They're, they're all they're all in the twenties now, which is way too strong for me personally. So I, I agree with the whole THC. You know uh, what you're saying about THC, and so. I think I think you were asking about what what people are breeding for. I think we are starting to see a resurgence of strains that are in sort of that. 15 to 20 percent sweet spot mm. that just have really compelling and high terpene content because that creates the flavor it modulates the effects it provides an element of aromatherapy so um you know some of the terpenes uh like linalool which is the principal terpene we find in lavender um are create very calming experiences you know so there there's there's no one easy answer when it comes mm. to cannabis or finding the right cannabinoid or terpene because our bodies all engage with it individually and differently. So, you know, just the same reason why an edible might hit you much different than it hits mm. me. It's because I might not have had a as big a breakfast as you, or I might, you know, be more hydrated than you, or I might have a higher tolerance to THC and some of those things. Is there, so with the recent legalization, I know that there's probably a lot of newbies out there. Yeah. Tons. And so is there sort of like a strain or recommendations you put out there for somebody who's never even tried it before? Yeah, definitely. I think the best place for people to start is with a balanced strain. And when I say balanced, I'm talking about the THC to CBD ratio in that strain. So THC and CBD have a really, really unique, compelling relationship. They they work better together um, because like, we, like I was saying earlier, terpenes and cannabinoids work together to modulate the way our receptors receive them. And so while you can get um, what's, you know, considered like isolated CBD from things like hemp and stuff. Um, I don't always recommend that for its medical benefits because you're not getting the full spectrum. It needs just a little bit of THC to really kick things in gear to engage your cannabinoids or your endocannabinoid system and, and get it flowing through your receptors and through your bloodstream. So it's good to get that full spectrum. Um, but with a beginner, who's unsure where to start, I like to tell them, start with a one-to-one -one because CBD also balances some of the anxiety that you get from high doses of THC. So a one-to-one -one should give you just enough THC so you can start to understand what that feeling is, but should also curb enough of the anxious and maybe some of the downsides of too much THC so that you can sort of find some comfort and some sweet spot and and if you try a one-to-one -one, um, and ask your bud tender if, if all this isn't, you know, making sense to you or whatever, your bud tenders will know what you mean when you're looking for a one-to-one -one ratio or a two-to-one or a 20-to-one, -one, any of that stuff. But if you, if you enjoyed sort of the psychoactive, the, the, the recreational aspects of cannabis, then know that you can crank up the, the THC level a little bit and back off the CBD level a little bit if you like. Or if you say, you know, that was maybe a little bit too much, but I still am looking for some of the benefits of cannabis, then ramp up the CBD and minimize the THC. Now, you mentioned bit. the entourage effect, which is uh, just for the listeners. This is, uh, I don't know who coined the term entourage effect, but it basically refers to how when cannabinoids. Mark Wahlberg, I think. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, when cannabinoids are present all together, their effects are, they multiply rather than add up. So studies will show that like just taking THC isn't as effective as taking THC with a bunch of other cannabinoids. Right. Same thing with, uh, with CBD, you get that entourage effect. But I do have a question about CBD in particular because from what I've read, it doesn't attach to either of the two receptors that, we've, that we're familiar with, the CB1 or CB2 receptor. Do we know yet how CBD modulates its effects? Um, so I, I am not, I'll be the first to say I'm not the best person to answer that. Um, the way I, I actually understood that CBD did engage with our CB2 receptors, okay. which um, are the ones in our bodies, not in the mind, which is um, why it's really good for things like um, pain and inflammation and some of those things without engaging the CB1 receptors um, in your brain, which is where a lot more of the psychoactivity and the feeling of high and euphoria and bliss and all of that come from. Um, but I do know that there is more to learn about CBD and the way that our body interacts with it because uh, 
it seems like a very, very useful tool with a lot of uses for a lot of different people with different ailments. Um, but we're really just starting to understand exactly what happens to our body and and how our body uh, metabolizes it and, and sort of what the result of all that is. Do you see benefits in people using, uh, rather than a CBD oil, uh, because it, let's say somebody doesn't want to get the psychoactive effect, mm-hmm. because there are people that genuinely don't want to feel altered. Although Definitely. I- and I should, I should clarify, we at Leafly like to use the word, word non-intoxicating. Got it. And that's because psychoactive means um, producing activity in your brain. Okay. And the reality is, is that CBD will produce activity in your brain. It's just not mind altering or perception Got altering. Um, so it, it is psychoactive, just to be clear, but it, its it effects are non-intoxicating. Doesn't you, get you high. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Okay. So do you think that there'd be benefit then from someone get, having like a full spectrum of hemp oil, which hemp is normally very low in THC, or at least it has to be? Mm-hmm. Could you see benefits from the entourage effect from that? Because it's all cannabinoids. Are they the same cannabinoids? In other words, is, is CBD from hemp the same as CBD from from cannabis. Yes. Yeah, so molecularly, they're the exact same compound. Okay, um, okay. The difference and and the the dichotomy between hemp and cannabis is really only there because the government says it's there. Um, <laughs> they're both the cannabis plant. The government defines hemp as anything less than like 0.3 or 0.03 percent THC. So it's the closest thing to to zero as possible. Um, basically, hemp is just cannabis without THC. Um, now it's, full, the le- it's the less cool plant, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the Ned Flanders of weed. It's, yeah. it's yeah. weed light. Yeah. 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 There you go. Uh, but the, the reality is, is that hemp hasn't been bred for anything more than its fiber for its biomass. Textile. Uh, right. And so you, while it can produce compelling terpenes and other cannabinoids, it hasn't been selectively bred for those things. So we're just now starting to see um, hemp, hemp strains, meaning high CBD, CBD dominant strains with less than the government, uh, you know, barrier for THC. And we're starting to see breeders, um, you know, emphasize the terpene content Mm -hmm. and, and develop them specifically for flavors. So things like hemp derived CBD can be more of a full spectrum and provide a, a greater experience because, um, the, you know, if you've if you've ever smoked a hemp flower or even some of the very early like high CBD, the Charlotte's Webs and some of the strains that first gained notoriety for their high CBD content, they just they weren't compelling cannabis strains um, be, other than their medicinal benefits because they didn't look very good. They didn't have the best flavor. They were sort of grassy and hay and what most people who consume cannabis regularly try to avoid. Yeah. Mm. So we're just now starting to see more and more um, genetic variety of these high CBD and CBD dominant uh, strains. Now, years ago, the, the, the reason why I ever got an interest in cannabis is I had a very close family member uh, who got stricken with cancer. And uh, it was it was a very bad form of cancer. Uh, there were no conventional treatments that would have helped her. Mm-hmm. And so I went uh, on a research spree to try and figure out what other alternative methods we could use that could may help either ameliorate uh, some of the, the negative side effects or symptoms of right. cancer or, or maybe even help potentially cure uh, cancer. And I'm very careful with, with my wording there. Yep, because, definitely. because you go online and you look up natural cancer treatments and there's like a million and one different things that pop up and everything from apricot seeds to sunlight to, you know, weird shit that's supposed to help you. Mm-hmm. So I, I, the litmus test that I used was, was study. Okay. It's studies like what su- studies are showing with non traditional cancer treatments. And I found animal studies I didn't find human studies, but I found animal studies that were really compelling with cannabinoids and how they were affecting, uh, in, in some studies were showing curing cancer in animals, or at least it kills uh, cancer cells. Right. And then I did further research and I discovered uh, Rick Simpson, who had this documentary mm-hmm. on it. And then I started reading all these anecdotes. And the way people were using it for cancer was this very, very thick, they would, they would take like a pound of cannabis and they would distill it down to this very thick, tarry substance right. that was extremely powerful and potent. And you were supposed to take it and, and up your dose because the studies showed that the more you took 
the more of an effect it had on cancer. And so I learned that for cancer patients, if that's, if that's what they wanted to do, this was the way that they used it. Are you, are you guys, in terms of how people use cannabis, are some forms better for some things than other? For example, pain, would people be better off with it being edible? Are you finding, because you guys have so many people that write into you yeah. and unfortunately there's not a lot of science yet on, on the best ways to use it. Are, what is the what are the anecdotes coming in like? How are people using them to treat different things? Yeah, so I mean, there's a lot of factors that come into play with with how your consumption method will affect the experience or target specific symptoms. Um, it really is case by case. Um, you know, obviously, if you have things like um, like COPD or or anything, you're not going to want to smoke. Um, you know, and so the first thing is we get more often than not is like, I I see the benefit of cannabis. I don't want to smoke. Maybe I'm an ex smoker. Maybe I've got lung cancer, who knows, but I, I don't want to smoke. How can I still benefit from this? So, you know, naturally, if you don't want to smoke, you can vaporize, which again, isn't the greatest choice if you have respiratory, respiratory ailments, uh, because inhaling anything um, in, into a weak system is not good for it. But, but um, you can also eat it. It's also topically available. Um, so really, it, it sort of depends. I mean, with things like pain, like you mentioned, um, pain can mean something totally different to, to anyone you ask. You know, pain thresholds are different, um, whether it's acute pain or uh, surface level pain or a bruise or, you know, all these sort of different potentials for pain. Um, but like with localized pain, you see a lot of people who really benefit from topical application, sore knees, sore backs, you know, they're, they're typically people who are looking, you know, maybe they're a construction worker who just, they stay active. They're on their feet. They use their body in their day to day. And so they need that quality of life that will allow them to perform their work, but also won't inhibit them from, you know, thinking on their feet, dealing with safety protocols, all those things that come along with people's day to day lives. So is uh, the most popular way still smoking though? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I would say smoking cannabis is still the most popular, um, with, uh, vaporization gaining rapidly. Um, and then I think for the newer consumer, um, edibles seem like a really, really easy entry point because everybody eats. Um, we all enjoy nice treats um, or a good meal. And so infusing them or mm. um, being able to, you know, for example, if you had an epileptic child and you were trying to give them the benefits of cannabis and they're a finicky eater because a lot of children are, then maybe you can find some food that they like and infuse it or add cannabis oil to it or whatever you need to do so that it makes sense to sort of integrate with whatever your lifestyle may be. All right. Let's talk about strains uh, for a little bit. I, I know where there's an individual variance mm-hmm. and I know... So in other words, some strains can affect some people differently than others. But you guys are such a big site. You're amassing a massive amount of people's anecdotes. Yeah. What's Are there strains that are starting to stand out in terms of their effects? Like generally speaking, people like this particular strain for creativity or for sex or for food or for sleep. Are you starting to see that? We are starting to see that. And we've seen those patterns for a while now. Um, I would say what what's honestly more compelling, um, although we want to be the hub for those conversations and for the, that anecdotal evidence is we're actually really starting to dive into what lab data can tell us about strains and knowing, uh, knowing what, what people are saying anecdotally and aligning those anecdotes with lab data to start connecting more of the dots to know that, well, people are liking this strain for this reason. And if you look, there's maybe a a tertiary cannabinoid or a tertiary terpene that's less prevalent in the cannabis landscape. That's more prevalent here. And maybe, maybe that's a connection that we should explore um, to start understanding some of those minor cannabinoids and terpenes a lot more. Um, We do, you know, as a bud tender, we used to make those anecdotal recommendations a lot. Um, For things like sleep, I always tell people to start with GDP. GDP is just a 
good sort of classic. What does that stand for? Uh, Granddaddy Purple. Sorry. Oh, okay. There um, you go. It was, it's a strain developed by Ken Estes uh, in the Bay Area. Um, he was a cancer patient, I believe, himself um, with his own terminal illness, and he needed something that would both stimulate his appetite and that he could replace his pain medications with. And so it's, um, you know, it is what I would classify as that more deeply relaxing um, sort of sedative stony vibe of cannabis. Um, and it also definitely gives me the munchies, although most cannabis does. Um, and so like when my mom who, who suffers from insomnia was like, okay, I'm ready. I want to try a vape cartridge. What should I try? She asked a bud tender and she got a bad recommendation. And I said, mom, what are you doing? Why didn't you just ask me? And she said, well, they didn't have the one you talked about before. And I said, go here, ask them for GDP. She found it. It worked. And, and I mean, that's not to say that it will, will work for everyone, but that's sort of the, the types of recommendations that we've been able to make historically. Now with the integration of, uh, lab data now that all cannabis on the legal market has to be lab tested, um, we're able to collect more and more of that data to start grouping these um, strains by both their chemotype and the resulting anecdotal evidence we have behind each one so that we can start bucketing these strains a little bit better. Oh, so you guys are going to be like the uh, Pandora of marijuana. So <laughs> if, I, if I like this, you may like this, this, and this also. Are you guys are you guys heading that way or what? Because that's pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, I think that's ultimately what, what happens when you purchase cannabis, right? You either come because you want to feel a certain way, because you want to certain flavor, um, because you want a certain experience because it's what you had last time and you enjoyed it. So you're, you're the more we can answer those questions and get better at answering them and have, you know, data that verifies what we're saying rather than just, Oh yeah, a bunch of other people said they like this for sleep or a bunch of other people said this helps them with their migraine headaches or whatever. Like, um, then it becomes a legitimate, idea that people like doctors can start to grasp that medical studies can mm -hmm. start to grasp and and dive into deeper and then obviously develop maybe some some real legitimate medicines for people to take um i personally view cannabis as a supplement um you know a lot of people view it as an intoxicant like alcohol or tobacco or something but it's almost like a daily supplement that you take it balances your system um, it's something I greatly enjoy and I consume it recreationally a fair amount, but at the same time, I'm getting all those therapeutic benefits. And I think that's a really interesting point that I like to drive home about sort of the difference between recreational cannabis and medical cannabis. And that is, is that there is no difference. Um, if you're consuming it medicinally, you're getting the recreational benefit of a better quality of life, some giggles, a good time with friends, all of those things. Um, and if you're consuming it recreationally, you're also getting some of the medicinal and therapeutic benefits of, you know, balancing your endocannabinoid system, um, stimulating your appetite, um, anything, you know, stress relief, pain management, anything that cannabis uh, is known to help yeah. for. I think there's definitely a sweet spot, though. I know for myself. Yeah, there definitely is. Yeah, I know for myself, if I have it daily, I don't I don't like the way uh, I'll, I'll feel. But once or twice a week seems to work. Now, that being said, in the past, um, when I've had certain what seem to be like autoimmune type symptoms, then I would use it on a nightly basis, mm -hmm. and, it, and it did benefit me. I think that's different from person to person. I think like anything – I mean, people abuse cheeseburgers. I think. You know, <laughs> yeah. You know, I 100%. think you go. I think you go too far with anything, uh, but it depends on the individual, you know, and and why you're using it. I wanted to ask you about the Afghani strains because uh, for any time I've used an Afghani strain, I sleep like a rock. <laughs> is that a is that a is that something you hear about those strains? Is that what they're known for? Or? Yeah, I mean, and and that's where a lot of the indicas make you sleepy come from. Is that indica, um, the short stout fat, dark green plants are um, from the Hindu Kush region originally okay. um, near Pakistan, Afghanistan, India, that region of the world. And um, they traditionally 
have had more of the sort of sedating, calming, relaxing effects of cannabis. And so all indicas sort of got bucketed into that. Got it. But a lot of the heavy sort of traditional indica effects and um, those those deeper, calmer aspects of cannabis um, are like – I would attribute mostly to the influence of Afghani or similar genetics. Oh, interesting. Now, what about energetic strains? Anecdotally speaking, what are some of the strains that you keep hearing from people that seem to give them more energy and creativity? Yeah, I mean, um, there's a bunch. Honestly, things like uh, Super Lemon Haze, Sour Diesel. Sour Diesel's really, that one's a common one. Right, yeah. And uh, um, honestly, I... I personally, um, un until we have more data to substantiate it, I like to tell people that that I think a lot of those uplifting and invigorating effects come from the terpene content and things like limonene, um, which is a prevalent uh, cannabis terpene, but also one we see all over the place. It's citrus. It's uplifting. It's bright. It's really, um, you know, it. it it's eye opening sort of it's invigorating in a sense. And, um, as far as like aromatherapy goes and stuff, you see citrus use as like a mood enhancer as an uplifter. And so when you see cannabis strains that are high in this terpene, it's not unusual to think that, Hey, maybe this is influencing the experience, giving me a little bit of lift with my THC, which is known to be euphoric and blissful. Um, and if there's, you know, very, very minute amount of, of CBN, then you're getting less and less of that sort of sleepy aspect of cannabis. And so you're, you're lifted up. I've never paid attention to the smells in the sense of how the smells may affect me when I, when I use can, I'll pay attention to the smells cause, oh, it smells good. It makes it more palatable if you will, mm -hmm. but I've never paid attention. And I'm going to start doing that because sour diesel, you mentioned sour diesel. For sure, if if I was gonna use a strain that was gonna maybe give me make me feel more creative or up lifted, it would be uh, sour diesel is one of them. Another one's green crack. Yep, definitely. <laughs> green crack will do that. Although green crack is a huge libido booster for me. Are there any strains that you're finding people are like, oh, this is the one you need to if you want to have some good sex with your girl or whatever. You know, that's one of the more common things we find people searching for cannabis. Um, one of the filters on Leafly is aroused. <laughs> Actually, we've been trying to determine um, more and more whether people mean like sexually aroused or just sort of excited yeah, aroused. I think they mean sexually. They mean sexually. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I'd say for everyone, it's a little different, but I, you know, green crack is a great example because it's not one where you're going to get lethargic. You know, you are going to be uplifted and invigorated. You're going to have that happy mood. You're going to have, um, you know, generally positive effects unless you're, unless you're maybe getting in your head a little bit. But so, yeah, things sort of that are known as those like traditional sativa uplifting effects mm -hmm. are generally what people want for arousal. I personally haven't found one specific strain that I would recommend for that, but um, people are definitely searching for strains that do that. And there's even companies um, like uh, I'm going to butcher their the the saying of their name, but it's. Fioria, I believe, or Foria, um, and they're essentially just an infused lubricant um, that's designed at increasing sexual pleasure, um, you know, topically as opposed to to consuming it via smoke. Yeah, it's weird. Yes. Whenever you apply a lube to yourself, you get aroused. Yeah, weird. <laughs> it's, it's weird. weird. Yeah, what are you doing yeah. in the corner yeah. over there, Adam? <laughs> it's working. That's so, funny. What about the heirloom strains that I hear so much about? Um, you know, I, I tell I've told the story on the on the show many times, but a, a particular strain was a was there was one particular strain I used when I when I created the first uh, fitness program that we we started selling, and it was Jack Herrera. And so yeah. I have this I have this very interesting relationship with that strain, but it does seem to be a creative strain. I don't have it very often because I usually don't I, I I don't typically use cannabis to be for recreational purposes usually, but rec, Jack Herrera is one that if I do I will. And I've heard it being referenced to as an heirloom strain. Yeah, so there's a couple things to unpack there. One is um, the difference between maybe an heirloom and a land race. So a land race is um, something that most of the heirloom strains were bred from. And they're then the native population of cannabis that, um, that uh, native 
civilizations cultivated or kept around them for whatever reason. Okay. Um, so the things like Afghani, things like Mexican land races, um, stuff that, that is sort of native to those parts of the world that then cannabis breeders have collected from around the globe and mixed and matched and, okay. and created things like the heirloom strains of Jack Herrera, um, AK-47, um, some of the older, old school sort of classic cannabis strains, as I like to describe them. Most of them were developed by Dutch seed banks because that was really the only place that could do breeding projects like that. Um, but Jack Herrera is a great heirloom strain. Um, it's named after um, the author of The Emperor Wears No Clothes, which is a book um, all about the history of hemp and cannabis that I believe was written in the 70s by Jack Herrera. Um, and he's just been a lifelong cannabis advocate um, who lost his his own fight. Um, but I even saw this weekend that his family and his son is carrying on his name. They've got their own brand um, and they're really continuing the conversation that Jack started. So it's cool to see the heirloom legacy mm -hmm. still being uh, perpetuated throughout the industry. Now, the the heirloom strains, and Jack is actually one that really gained notoriety from people who really suffered from medical ailments, who wanted to consume cannabis, but didn't want the, the sedating elements of cannabis. So people who just wanted a better quality of life still wanted to go on about their normal day. Some of those things really, really latched on to Jack Herrera. Mm. Um, and so that's what's elevated. And, and I know actually a fair amount of people like it for its sort of arousing effects even. So um, the other heirloom strains, I mean, there there's things like Skunk One, which is, um, you know, a heavy indica um things that have come from skunk one are like cheese even green crack is a descendant of mm. uh, skunk one i believe it's just a specific phenotype that is sort of unique in that skunk one is traditionally you know uh basically as, as pure of an indica as you could get and yet green crack which is a descendant is almost thought of completely as a pure sativa. Mm -hmm. So that in and of itself sort of um, explains the the conundrum between the indica sativa dichotomy. Now you've been in this for so long, so you've seen some of the evolution. And I've argued this on the show that a couple things in my, my opinion, maybe you disagree or, or agree with me, need to change about the industry before it gets adopted nationwide. And one of them is the naming of the strains like mm -hmm. Green Crack or Alaskan Thunderfuck or whatever. That, that's an actual name of it. Which is a, a great strain. Which is great. <laughs> it's a fantastic strain. But that's, First strain I ever grew. It's one, is it really? <laughs> it's one of my favorite strains. Yeah. That's literally the name of a strain. And then also <laughs> the products like, you know, you're going to have Fruity Pebbles Thunderous. cereal with THC in it and candy and lollipops and stuff like that. And I'm like, look, if, if they want to go national with this, they're going to have to like make it more, I guess – move away from the kind of stoner vibe and move it more towards this professional type of thing. Do you agree or disagree? Do you think that's a, or is that an element of it that'll never change? Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't agree or disagree with it. I think, you know, if, if you're a cannabis company aimed at a medical consumer, then yeah, you need to clean some of that stuff up. If you're a cannabis company aimed at having fun and being playful, then some of those things work just fine. I mean, we see, craft beer with all sorts of absurd names, dog piss and moose drool and good point. all sorts of stuff. It's not to say that it, it needs to go away completely, but we do need to abolish things like, um, you know, trademark infringement and mm -hmm. some of those things that have run rampant in the, in the cannabis industry for so long. And that's just a legitimizing factor. If we want to be thought of as legitimate businesses and, and operating legitimately, then we can't be stealing other people's ideas and, and brands. And that's just, that's just common sense. I think that's sort of the growing pains and, and some of the maturity issues that the industry has been faced with and is continuing to evolve out of. Um, now, I sort of, the, the part I struggle with when it comes to like the candies and the gummies and there's sort of all this backlash over like, oh, that's, that's for children or whatever. I'm a 34 year old adult. I love bright colors and gummy candy. That doesn't make me a bad person. Mm. And I should be able to find an infused gummy if I want. 
but I think the the there's vitamin C gummy bears. Exactly. It, it, when you're talking about <laughs> when you're talking about medical supplements, the gummy is actually the or dietary supplements. The the gummy is actually the the fastest growing category because yeah. old people can chew them, young people can chew them, um, and they're easy and enjoyable. Other than so, you know yeah. popping a pill or mm. having a bad tasting supplement, and so. Why can't we, as as the cannabis industry, utilize some of those same tactics to make our products consumable? Okay. Now, speaking on uh, as far as the business end of it, I know that Marlboro has just invested quite a bit of money coming in. It's like yeah. four something billion dollars coming into the industry. Two point four Canadian, I believe. Right. So. Talk to me about your thoughts in terms of like big, huge, you know, tobacco companies now getting their hands in it. I mean, it's not surprising. We've right. we've heard rumors of it since long before I was even born that that Marlboro already had Marlboro Greens all ready to pull the trigger the second it was legal. Um, you know, the the reality is is that that money is being poured into cannabis, especially Canadian cannabis, because they've been the first G seven nation to really embrace it on mm-hmm. a on a nationwide level. Um, and you know, if one, if the states doesn't act soon, then Canada is going to be the epicenter and we're going to miss out on a lot of that economic opportunity. Um, and two, I mean, I think investment in cannabis is a good thing. Um, I would caution consumers to just do some research, figure out where your cannabis is coming from, who's growing it, who's funding it. And, um, you'll start to see some patterns and, you know, just like all industry and anything that capitalism can touch, you know, there's a right way to do things and a wrong way to do things. And, you know, I don't think investment in cannabis is inherently bad, but I think, um, you know, I would encourage people to support the pioneers of this industry who have risked a lot of time, a lot of money and their own freedoms to showcase what this plant can do for people. And there's a lot of them. In fact, almost all of them, if they're not already locked up, um, active in this space and you are able to support them and you are able to find mom and pops or, um, you know, victims of the drug war who are now being propped up by cannabis and we should be supporting them. The irony of it is too, that the more we, when we legalize, if we regulate it too much, we're just going to maintain a really strong black market. You know, like you go to, uh, like in New York, I think it's in New York, they have a huge cigarette black market because they've taxed and regulated the shit out of cigarettes so much that people are selling them on the black market. So the irony of it is, you know, legalizing it isn't necessarily the answer. It has to be legalized with like appropriate regulation, not make it so insane that you, people will just buy it on the black market anyway well, because it's going to cost you a million dollars. That's an interesting direction to take this conversation. And I'm curious to hear your opinion. Um, you know, I, I noticed that being somebody who was in the clubs, uh, grown, still have a lot of relationships with both club owners and growers. There still seems to be a pretty strong black market. And kind of what I see now and what I was seeing when I was leaving the space was the clubs were in the price wars of being able to provide an eighth of weed for the cheapest price they possibly mm-hmm. can. And then there was still this market for like really high and high end like connoisseur type mm-hmm. weed. And so I, I feel like, I mean, and I still don't get all of my cannabis from a uh, from a dispensary. In fact, if I can get to one of my good friends that are growers uh, that grow really top notch product that I know how they're growing it too, um, I prefer that. And sometimes I feel like the quality of the cannabis clubs, even some of these really big nice cannabis clubs, isn't always the triple A stuff. Do you feel the same way too, or am I totally off here? Yeah, I mean, I think I don't. I don't disagree with you at all. Um, I think part of it comes from the conundrum of licensing. Um, more, especially in California, we're we're you know really a year into it at this point, and hardly any of the industry has been granted their license. So the market mm-hmm. has completely shrunk. So all those operators that are busy trying to get their businesses back off the ground because they've had to go through this big regulatory shift, um, you know, are either looking at other means to survive, whether that's illicit markets or other business opportunities or just ways to scrape by until they can get licensing from the government. Um, so I think some of that will go away as more and more of these businesses get licensed. Um, but also I think 
states need to encourage home grow. Uh, I know that's prevalent here in in California, and I would encourage any anyone who lives in a state that allows you to grow your own cannabis to do it, uh, whether you do it on a larger scale or perpetually, like that's up to you, but do it one time, figure out what it takes and you'll learn so much about the plant. It'll teach you way more than you could ever teach it. And, um, you know, the black market is, is not going to go away completely. There's always going to be people who, sort of like the criminal element and like operating in that space. Um, but I think for the 99.9% of us that just love cannabis and want to be able to do what we want to do, we will find ways, whether it's by getting licensed or collaborating with licensed grows to make that happen. Um, you know, I also think that gifting cannabis as a personal grower is is the same as someone, you know, sharing a beer that they brewed at home. You know, it's probably got a little bit more craft in it. It's maybe a little bit of a more amateur approach to it or a bootstrapped approach to it, but that adds some character and and some nuance to it that you might not get from, you know, commercial scale grows or breweries or whatever else you want to look at. Right. Let's, let's talk a a little bit about um, dabbing and the evolution of that. This, uh, um, I know we were some of the first ones to do this in the early 2000s. Back then it was earwax and honeycomb and then it evolved to shatter and, uh, now I have some of my really close friends that are producing clear, um, share with the audience that has no fucking idea what I'm talking about right now, <laughs> what, what that's been. And cause I, you know, you, I, I'm assuming you're a dabber based off oh, your yeah. Instagram based name. Yep. name. That's, so. that's my bread and butter. I love, uh, hash and concentrates, but specifically solventless hash is, is the go-to and what I would consider the upper echelon of cannabis. Um, as far as like consuming a really nice, like aged scotch, let's say solventless hashes, essentially that. Now, when you get into extraction of cannabis, the world is just as diverse as growing it, as as operating in this space, no matter what you're doing. So um, we could probably do a whole nother show on cannabis extraction alone. But um, basically, you know, the idea behind extraction, and there's a number of different methods to do it, is to remove the plant material and separate the the essential oils that contain the cannabinoids and terpenes. And this really started with like bubble hash, right? Well, this was probably the the first original form of that, correct? Well, going back even further, I mean, uh, you know, charas and Moroccan dry sieve hash and, and some of those things, those cultures figured out cannabis extraction long before we were growing cannabis for the flower. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, modern cannabis extracts definitely are sort of the evolution from bubble hash, which just takes cold ice water and agitates the plant so that the trichomes become brittle, separate from the plant, and then you sieve them through a number of different uh, micron screens, refining further and further until you're left with sort of just the the prime uh, trichome heads. Mm. And then, and then moving from there, like, what are they doing to make these, like you were saying, clear and, and, and yeah. So, so to take it a step further, um, when you start, so, so bubble hash and, and solventless hash specifically is a very hands-on process. It's a, it's very much a craft. Uh, but if you're looking at larger scale production, you're looking at things like using, um, chemical solvents, uh, like butane and propane and some of those, uh, solvents, as well as things like CO2, um, to extract um, extract that oil, and then you you essentially cook off the residual solvent so that all that remains is that beautiful hash oil that you you were after. Um, so again, there's a number of different techniques and methods you can accomplish that by, but really what it takes is is a big chamber that you would fill with your plant matter containing all the cannabinoids and terpenes that you're trying to extract, and you blast them in a closed loop system through with high powered CO2 or high pressure, um, high pressure butane and propane mixes. Um, and that resulting raw extract, um, basically captures the full spectrum of the plant. And from there you can do some 
post-processing, things like distillation, um, a number of different ways people distill it, but um, short path tends to be the most popular and without getting too technical, but basically what you're doing is is distilling off or, or vaporizing at different temperature ranges different compounds, knowing that they have different boiling points, we can boil them off separately, encapsulate them or isolate them and encapsulate them and then remove any things like solvents and, and stuff that remain so that we're left with just those isolated cannabinoids, which is why you see things like liquid distillate at like 99% THC. I was going to say it's like super strong. I, I, that I mean, would be the clear. Yeah. So yeah. like like hitting one dab is like the equivalent of how, the equivalent of how many hits off of a joint, for example. Uh, uh, it's, it's a lot stronger, right? Right. It's more potent. It's definitely more potent. I mean, uh, the the sticky point is you could take a big dab, you could take a small dab. There's nothing that says you have to get a certain amount of Bomb high from a, yeah. from a dab. Mm -hmm. um, now, just to put it in perspective, I would say most concentrates fall between 65 and 85% THC if that's what they're going for. You see the same thing with things like CBD and stuff, although oftentimes much lower just because they're concentrated um, in lower quantities. But, um, you know, so if you think about a small dab being about the same as maybe like smoking an entire joint to yourself, and that joint, if you rolled a big, nice gram joint, is about 20%, 25% THC. So with a gram, you're looking at, you know, 250 milligrams mm. of THC. And if you're taking a dab, which let's say is probably less than a tenth of a gram and is, you know, 65% THC, you're, you're getting down there at about the same conversion. Now, it obviously hits you different because in a dab you're it's you're, right away you're it's like, flash vaporization so you're you're getting it almost instantaneously and you're getting what what essentially you would get in that whole joint like that mm. um, and so not for the beginner or the or not for the <laughs> person with low tolerance you know i i would argue that too i think there's a i think there's a misconception that that dabs are inherently a means of like overconsumption um uh, one of my favorite things to do is give people their first dab, and that's because I want it to be an enjoyable experience. A lot of people, when they give people their first dab, they sort of want it to be like a rite of passage and, and put them through the ringer. And like that might work in a fraternity or something, but like if you're really trying to get someone to understand and enjoy cannabis and cannabis concentrates, like you want to create an enjoyable experience that they can repeat and, and enjoy time and time again. So... Um, while I would caution uh, someone with lower tolerance or a beginner, I would say you can still safely and effectively dab. It's just about finding the right product, the right dose, and really the right temperature. Because if you dab at a low enough temperature, you're, you're effectively vaporizing it at basically the minimum boiling point so that, um, you know, things like harshness or um, some of the anxieties that come with that much THC hitting you that fast are actually sort of leveled off a little bit. Did you bring your rig mm. with you? I have my Puffco Peak in the car if you uh, want me to. Oh, uh, shit. We, it's might all make, you, Adam. we might have to make these guys dab <laughs> no, for the man, very first I don't, don't want to get the womp womp. Remember the womp womp? <laughs> yeah. Have you had any bad experiences? I, I, I mean, of course. Yeah. yeah, I think as. What was your first? Tell us about your first time just fucking doing too much. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my first time over consuming cannabis was, I think, probably like a lot of people's, and that was my first edibles experience. Oh, and yeah. that's really because your body metabolism metabolizes cannabis differently when you eat it. Yep. It converts um, it to a different form of THC, right? right? Yeah, yeah, it, it does. It converts it to a different enzyme within your stomach. Um, also, your digestive tract um, is just a much longer process than your endocannabinoid system. So, um, you know, the same way that when you go to the hospital and they give you an injection, it gets right to your bloodstream, whereas if you take a pill, it takes some time to get it dispersed throughout your body. Um, so... For, um, oh man, it must have been my 20th, 19th birthday maybe, um, my best friend's older brother, who was always like the cannabis guru, you know, the typical like older brother who showed you how to make your first Got pipe out of, a, out of an apple. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so um, he knew it was my birthday, so he was like, 
happy birthday. Here's two pot brownies for you. And of course I'm like, sweet. I love weed. I smoke weed all day, every day. Let's enjoy these. And my buddy's like, it's your birthday. Like you're going to eat weed. I'll just drive you around from, you know, birthday party to birthday party or whatever. And so I end up, you know, typical, typical edibles horror story. I ate half of it, got impatient, said this isn't working. So I ate the other half. And by the time I finished the other half, the first half was hitting me and I was already starting to lose it. Um, I don't, I remember having a really good time. I remember being just sort of so lethargic that like, if you've ever had surgery, um, and come out of anesthesia, the few hours after anesthesia where like <laughs> your mind is awake, but your body isn't quite there yet. That was the edibles experience my first time. And I just remember catching glimpses of myself, you know, in the rear view mirror of the car and just being like, how'd we get back in the car? Oh, now I'm with new people. Oh, now we're eating dinner, I guess. And, you know, so it's sort of uh, the strobe light effect throughout. It it really didn't, uh, mostly because I I was in a good setting with good people and I enjoyed cannabis already. So it wasn't anything I hadn't necessarily experienced to some degree. But it was definitely the type of experience where you woke up the next day going, oh, my God, what happened? It's one of those things like the (laughs) first time I had an I I did too much. I didn't do any for like years afterwards. It frightened. That's pretty common. (laughs) Yeah, it's one it's one of the worst things to in my opinion, to overdose on. It's um, really not, though. It's well, really it's not. not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's really not. Not I mean, in terms of danger. It's right. probably yeah. the best thing to overdose on. It really yeah. is, right? It's just the, it's the mental aspect of it. That That's makes the you, part. Yeah, yeah, that makes you think that way. You think you're going to yeah, die. Yeah, you overdose on alcohol, you are gonna you can die. Right. Yeah. You know I mean? It's pretty hard to die on cannabis <laughs> to, you know, to take too much. So, you you know, earlier we were talking about uh, the different effects of, uh, of cannabis based on the chemical constituents. Can the way you grow a particular strain then change its effects? In other words, can one type of uh, Jack Herrera affect me one way and of then course. I do it again and then it affects me totally of different because it was grain, it was grown differently? Yeah, totally. Um, and I mean, that's the it. It's just you're a product of your environment, right? So, like, if you split two twins up at birth and they were raised in totally different environments, while they'd have a lot of the same traits, same mannerisms, and stuff, like they'd inherently have some differences Mm -hmm. too. So, you know, the amount of care, the amount of sunlight, the amount of, of nutrients and, and, and water and, you know, humidity levels, there's so many variables that can affect how the, the cannabis plant ends up. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, with good stable genetics, those differences should be smaller and less distinguishable, but, you know, there's there's a lot of genetic variability in cannabis. So. Yeah, how hard is it to grow it then? Because you, you were talking earlier about promoting home grows, but then when people talk about growing it, they're like, oh, you got to get lights, you got to do this, you got to do that, you got to make sure you have the right chemical of, of this vitamin, and this nutrient. And I'm like, it's a plant that grows naturally. Shouldn't you be able to plant? I mean, especially in California, am I wrong? Is it is it super hard to grow? Or is it just that growers spend so much time on it because they're perfecting it, just like if you were to go to a commercial tomato grow whatever versus the average person where you could just put it in a pot and grow it. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's called weed for a reason. It, it's not hard to grow Mm. cannabis. It's, it takes a lot of passion and a lot of time and energy to grow good cannabis. Okay. So yeah, I think it's more like the latter of what you were explaining. And that is that, that people just cannabis growers inherently care and, and the nuance matters to them and the, the subtle differences matter and the subtle results matter. And so they care about the every little thing that they're feeding to it and the way they're nurturing these plants. So it takes um, what I would say is not so much that it's like hard or difficult Um, You can make it as technical or as easy as you sort of want. It's as easy as putting a seed in some dirt and giving it the right amount of water and sun, you know, that will grow cannabis. But to grow really, truly exceptional terpene rich Mm -hmm. or to breed things for exceptional traits or qualities or rare cannabinoids, things of that nature, like that really takes attention to detail passion and and experience more than anything well you drew the you know you compared it to the tomato plant which is a perfect one to compare to since the macro profile is almost identical to that and if you were to just take a tomato plant and water it every once in a while versus 
measuring its nutrient level mm-hmm. and taking really good care of it. I mean, you're going to get this beautiful tomato that tastes amazing and is great, or it's going to taste okay, right? Yeah, they're right. just squeezing out more out of the plant. Um, in regards to the to public perception, that has changed a lot, hasn't it? Because mm-hmm. you've been doing this for a little while now. Yep. I'm sure before you reviewed like, oh, you know, stoner or whatever. Now is the perception totally changed? Or does it depend where you're at? Like if you're in California, it, it's all good. Yeah, I think it depends where you're at. Um, you know, on the West Coast and and where I'm from in Seattle and definitely in California, I think in a lot of ways we've we've had cannabis publicly available and safely available to us for some time now, uh, whether it was medical or recreational. And uh, I sometimes get caught up in my bubble of like, oh, wait, there's still people going to jail for this mm-hmm. other places. Right. Um, and it, so it's good to to have reminders and to be cognizant of that, that, that in a lot of ways, this, uh, as much as I believe it should be a right, it's, it's very much a privilege at this point. Um, and so the perceptions are definitely changing. I can't have a family meal or holiday without inevitably the conversation turning towards cannabis. It's, you know, Partly, it's a hot button topic politically. Um, it's got such big economic and and industrial impact that that you're seeing sort of the the collision of all sorts of things like technology and and everything colliding into this space all at once. So there's a lot of opportunity and optimism and and you know excitement around the plant and the things we can do with it and the fact that we're just now starting to be able to really study it and understand it um so perceptions are changing i think there's still a lot of stigma to break down people still have lazy stoner stereotypes in their head whether it's when you're applying for a job or the fact that employers will still you know, drug test you for cannabis in states with legal cannabis um, seems kind of counterintuitive, especially for some of the jobs you you might be applying for. Oh, I, I think it's so hypocritical. Like if, if you were to meet, a, you know, new people and, and they say, oh, what do you do for a living? Oh, I have a vineyard. Oh, that's a wow. That's amazing. Wow, Great yeah. job. You know, oh, I grow cannabis, you know, and you get totally different impression or, you know, so. But so I think the stigma definitely needs a change. I think it's changing, but it's it's taking a little bit. It of time. is, and honestly, I think the the biggest thing that will change it is more and more because I don't know about you guys, but I know a lot of people who consume cannabis, and they come from all walks of life. There is no box that you could put a cannabis consumer in because there's so many ways to consume it, reasons to consume it, you know, different strains to to be attracted to and and touch points for cannabis in sort of any lifestyle. So like it, it just is going to take more lawyers and cops and judges and people, politicians, you know, people mm-hmm. to come out and just say, yeah, I consume cannabis. I do it responsibly. It's not a bad thing. Mm. How does Leafly monetize right now? What is their main source of monetization? Uh, digital advertising. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Interesting. That's cool. You guys have an app? Yep, we have a mobile app available uh, on Android and yeah. the App Store and everything. It's yeah. my so it's the first place I'll go to review a strain. If I get a new strain and I want to see, you know, what people say about it and what you know the effects that are being reported, you guys are killing it. The, the best best site that I've seen. So awesome, thank yeah. you. Yeah, awesome. and if you want to find a new strain, you can filter, you know, by effects, by flavors, by some of those things, and try something new. Um, and some of those. Uh, features and capabilities we're working to make bigger and better for both consumers and business to make the shopping experience really what it can be and what it should be, uh, at least in, in the digital space, while giving businesses tools to, to be more effective and reach their consumers. Any uh, any companies that you, you like right now or that you're paying attention to that you think are doing really cool stuff in the space or even edible or, or vaporizers or companies that you think are doing things the right way? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I, I will say I'm not as familiar with the California market just because I don't spend as much time here. And there's been a lot of movement, so I don't exactly know everyone who's fully licensed at this point and stuff. But I will say I just came from the Emerald Cup um, and there was a number of brands there doing really cool things. Um, uh, I love as far as extracts go, because that's sort of my bread and butter. I love 710 Labs. They do um, solventless extraction, but they also do solvent based live resins and stuff like that. They're um, 
their saying is, I believe OGs grow better OG. And that's just really, <laughs> they're saying they've been in this game for a long time. They know what to look for. Mm -hmm. um, they have a keen eye for using the right genetics. So um, if you like extracts, definitely check out 710 Labs. I believe they're also available in Colorado, which is where the business started before uh, California legalized. Um, and what else? I mean, there's, um, you know, back home, I'm a big, big fan of gold leaf gardens. They grow, um, in living soil indoors, which is basically they're, they're beyond organic. Um, they're not able to use the organic term because that term is actually owned by the federal government. Um, so you can't market your cannabis as organic. Oh, really? inter that's interesting. <laughs> not currently because it has to be approved. Um, I did not know that. Yeah. It has to be approved by the government. It to has to be approved approved. by the federal government. And that is a term that they Wow. Own. Now I know a lot of people do do that. So that's a little loophole there. So the government can come in and yeah, say, wow. they, they can. And uh, you know, it's, I know one reason I love gold leaf so much is because they do, they practice this this beyond organic method of growing cannabis, which is rare in and of itself. But the fact that they do it indoors is even that much more rare because a lot of people doing regenerative farming are doing it outdoors. Um, uh, but they're working with uh, the Washington State Department of Agriculture to get organic certification at a state level because the state is on board. The state wants these things. It's just, again, the the balance between state government and federal government. It'll be interesting to see which brands go national once it becomes, it's going to become legalized nationally. Uh, Kiva is a good, as a brand oh, yeah. based out of California. And I, I, from day one, they're just so uniform, so clean looking. Mm -hmm. They look like they're already a, a, a national. They've, yeah. They've been well established. I know they were really active in the medical market. They've spent time really like on their product development, on their branding, on really like creating a foundation so that they can do things like taking a brand national, which, you know, a lot of brands, um, not that they're bad, but they might be a little short sighted. They're, mm. they're maybe bootstrapped or they're just too focused on, um, you know, they're, they're maybe thinking a little too small. I mean, we need the people who want to think small as well, but if you're doing things like taking a brand national, you need some of those more foundational yeah, in, in my opinion, I, I, this the way I would predict it happening is, is if it does go national, first off, the big players are going to come in and they're going to they're gonna buy out the really good uh, state brands. That's mm -hmm. what I think. So I yep. think like Kiva, they have the process, they got the brand, they have the recognition. Then you'd have like Nabisco or someone come in and buy them and put it out. That's just my personal opinion because once it goes national, you're competing with those monsters. Oh, just yeah. like Marlboro. Like good luck mm -hmm. trying to grow weed in, 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 you know, unless you're kind of a craft brand. I mean, to, com to compete with someone like Marlboro on the national stage for oh, Nabisco. What a, great, what a great brand to do it, you, you say. Yeah, yeah. You just like pulled that. that out off the cuff there, but that's yeah, not a bad one, right? It, absolutely. I mean, you know. Used Oreos? Yes, right? Yeah, <laughs> it, it makes perfect sense oh, sounds delicious. that these big brands would do that. So, like I said, I think Mar Marlboro's already, they already grow plants. They've got yeah, all I mean, the processing. Saw, yeah, Marlboro invested in Canadian cannabis. I believe uh, Corona or the whoever owns Corona invested in Canadian cannabis brands as well. Anheuser Busch. Yeah, I was saying. Yeah. Sanheuser Bush. Yep, yep. And there's this one brand of uh, cannabis. It looks like it's beer, but it's not. And it's just a cannabis drink. And it was, remember the brand I showed you guys? It was like that Mexican bre mm. uh, beer brand, but now it's, anyway. Lagunitas? Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Lagunitas has their Terp Tonic or whatever they're calling it. They're already in it? They, Yeah, wow. they're they're in it. Well, one thing, uh, Lagunitas actually has a a sort of longstanding history with cannabis. They're, they're from Northern California. They're very much sort of ingrained in that culture and the counterculture and the, the community there. And so their story, they've put out things like hemp ales and stuff previously, I'm pretty sure. Um, but they they partnered with Absolute Extracts, which is a California yeah. extract brand. And they did, a, they did a partnership. And I believe what they did before things went recreational is they actually created um, cannabis vape cartridges, hop vape cartridges, that they what? they extracted hop oil and mixed it with the cannabinoid distillate that we were talking about and gave you sort of beer flavored um, extract. Oh, that's hilarious! And then in reverse of that, once it went legal and and what you guys were talking about is is there essentially their infused non beer because it's non alcoholic. It's uh it's almost like a a tonic that's infused. Um, it's 
it's like a. It tastes like it tastes like that aftertaste of beer, but it's not alcohol. Yeah, it's, it's like a it's like a Lacroix, but uh, for hops that's infused. Mm. It's yeah. like the essence of hops with sparkling water or mm. whatever, however they brew so it to smart. make it. Ferment. Another, another thing that I'm seeing that the cannabis market's doing that I think is brilliant is because of the regulations on packaging, where they have to have these kind of like childproof type packages. You know, I bought, it, it was a Lagunitas. It came in a can, like a soda, mm-hmm. but it had this like little top on it that, you know, obviously a kid wouldn't be able to open, but it was reusable. And I'm seeing more and more packaging come out because of the regulation. I think it's ingenious. I think that's smart because mm-hmm. you got to get around that stigma before you go national. Yeah. And, and I mean, the, the the packaging conversation, I think the, the safety element is definitely important. Um, but at the same time, the cannabis industry is getting somewhat of a bad rap for the amount of waste that they're creating. Oh, uh, because of that. The plastic waste, yeah. but it, it's a necessary evil, and it's not something that most of these cannabis companies want. They don't want to overpackage their product, yeah. but they have to to meet regulation. They have to use, you know, certain thickness of plastic wrapping mm-hmm. for the candy wrappers that's like three or four times as thick as what your normal candy would be wrapped in. And while I understand like the safety mechanism about making it harder for someone with, you know, little hands to open or whatever, at the same time, what's that doing to our environment? And like the cannabis community in general tends to be stewards for the planet and for the environment. Not, not all of them, but most of them will tell you that, that they want to support doing things sustainably and the right way. And some of the regulation or over-regulation is sort of um, creating some new stigma around cannabis. Yeah, and meanwhile, I have I have Sudafed at home and blister packs that kids can pop open and, oh, yeah. and crush, and it's way more dangerous. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So anything cool in the market of uh, of cannabis that you're seeing right now that's kind of emerging? Yeah, like really anything cool to look out for? Doing. Yeah. I mean, the biggest sort of hype recently is um, diamonds and sauce, and that's in the extract world. That's basically um, isolated THCA or, or pure THC um, with its native terpenes. And so, um, you know, to, to simplify it a bit, it's essentially that raw extract I was describing earlier, and then they post-process it to allow it to separate. And when THC separates from the terpenes, it crystallizes um, uh, almost like you would see like rock candy or uh, it's so crazy. Some of this stuff's retailing at like a hundred a gram. Isn't oh it? yeah. More than that, That's even depending nuts. on how they've done it and the processes and the strains they're using and all of that. And it's really like, it's a unique and inventive and very like visually stunning way to present, um, cannabis and pure THC because it really does. It looks like quartz or, or diamonds, you know, um, it's very, very cool. Um, but part of me says, you know, the, it's the same thing. You could take that raw extract. Yeah, it's actually it's, it's still it's, the same. It's no better, and it's actually more work to produce. It's more it. work to yeah. produce it's it. It's just visually appealing. It's visually appealing. You know, it's it's um, uh, you know, uh, there's nothing wrong with it by any stress stretch. But like, if you just want flavor and effect, like you, you almost already have that from the from the uh, raw extra I, I predicted it would come and go type of deal it's just like we've had a lot of those different things like that that are cool they look cool or taste cool and it's like it's just a little ridiculous to yeah I mean I don't know that it'll come and go I think the the market likes novelty so I think there will always be a place for products like that I do think that the hype will die down a little bit and the price points might come down a little bit and people you know might but but I also think like that's that's the innovation right now. And that's what people are excited about. And extraction in general is where like a lot of the advances and and understanding of isolated cannabinoids and stuff are coming from. So it's, it's all very exciting. And I think that's why it's the hype is because people are like, Whoa, look at this thing we just learned how to do now when they learn how to do something new, that'll be the hype. Yeah, yeah. So, well, thanks for coming on, man. Yeah. yeah I really thank appreciate you guys the for conversation. Absolutely. Where are you based out yeah. of, by the way? I'm based out of Seattle. Okay. Good deal. So yep. if you ever come down, Oh, come back on the show. Oh, we I go up there will. too, so we'll come yeah, say hi. Absolutely. Come by, definitely. All right, thanks, Will. Yeah, thank you guys. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. 
Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.